glory to your name, Jesus. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. All my fears are gone. All my fears are gone. All my fears are gone. Yeah. Because he lives, yeah. Because he lives, yeah. Because he lives, yeah. I know who holds tomorrow. Because I know who holds tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Life is worth living. The race is worth running. The press is worth pressing. The fight is worth fighting. Because I know, I said, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. got to walk into. It's already done. Come on, y'all. Come on. It's already done. Hey, come on. <laughs> it's already done. Yeah. It's already done. It's already
So they have two things going on. They have kidney failure and they have uh, COVID-19. And so what we decided to do is partner with Fresenius today, We're bringing the employees and those that are here for dialysis today lunch. If you look in the back, I've got pizzas in my uh, the back of the car. We're going to be serving them lunch. Pastor Skip now is going to give them beverages. But then after that, there's a group of us that are from the Love in Action team and some from the pastoral staff that are going to be praying for the people that are inside the clinic today. We got our masks, we got uh, we got to stay in our cars, we got our gloves on and all of that. But we just wanted to show our support and then undergird these individuals, believing that by faith, the power of God is going to move into that clinic today and people's lives are going to be transformed forever by the power of God. So join us. care of our patients. We thank you for your prayers and we love you and honor you and, and we thank God. <laughs> hey World Outreach family, family, we're out here in the community. This is Pastor Yolanda under this mask. It's an honor to be here today. We are at Fresenius Dialysis Clinic. These are the nurses and the staff that we'll be praying for today. And over here is one of the other staff members and we're going to be praying for the patients. Yes. Woohoo! Come on out of here. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you for agreeing with us in faith and in prayer that God is going to do something miraculous and amazing here in this facility. We want to thank Miss Kenyatta Rome for inviting us to come and release the power of God over Fresenius and also in the protection of those who are serving in the dialysis clinic. Listen, we have the most amazing church in the entire world. I don't care what anybody says. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for showing up. This has been a, a great event and um, we just believe that it's the beginning of the end of this COVID-19 situation. And so from that vantage point, we're going to have Pastor Yolanda go ahead and pray. And we're going to believe God by faith that every person that's in there today, God is going to touch their bodies and they're going to be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you for moving by your spirit, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you that we're touching and agreeing and all that we're praying, Father God, expecting miracle signs and wonders. Father, you said that your word is health and healing to all our flesh. We thank you, Father God, that your word is health. Your word is healing. Your word is medicine to our flesh, oh God. And we thank you right now, Father, for moving mightily in the name of Jesus. Father God, right now we bind the spirit of fear. We cast it down now in the name of Jesus. We take authority over fear right now. Fear, go in Jesus' name. You're beneath our feet in Jesus' name. I pour out your spirit upon this clinic, Father God. The patients are coming off all these machines, Father God. And healing is being made known to their families, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for moving today. This is the day you have made, and we shall rejoice, and we shall be glad in it. the Word of God. You know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, you cannot just uh, ignore worship and just, and I see so many people do it, they ignore worship and I, I just want to get in there for the Word. I just want to get up in there for the Word. But that's really a selfish uh, way of thinking because you got to understand something. The worship is for God, but the Word is for us. God doesn't need the Word because He is the Word. What He wants from us is to worship Him. And I believe he deserves that. So whenever you have an opportunity to worship God and, and just release your heart to him and tell him how much you love him and how much you appreciate him, take full advantage of it. I mean, really, give your all to worship. Don't go through the motions. Don't just, you know, sing because you know the words or that's the time. But here's your time to tell God thank you. Take advantage of it. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. But let's get into this word. Father... We thank you so much for this time of coming together. We thank you for these amazing people that are hearing this word. And they're not just hearing this word, but they're believing it. And they're doing this word. Father, I pray that this morning that you would open up the eyes of their understanding and begin to flood their heart with light, illumination, and revelation. Father, this morning, may they see like they've never seen before. May they hear like they've never heard before. May we understand like we've never understood before, Father, so we can do what we've never done before. Now, Father, I thank you that you've anointed me to minister this word on a level that the church and the world is unfamiliar with. All to the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, you know, when I was, I was younger, um, I've always been a huge basketball fan. I've always loved basketball, and I've always tried to find ways to play. And when I was in elementary school and even going into my junior high years, 
I loved basketball, but there was other guys that matured uh, above me and quicker than I did and understood some things about their, their game more than I did. And so in order for me to get on teams, I would have to really work on my game. I'd have to work on dribbling. I'd have to work on shooting. I'd have to work on defense and sliding my feet. Whereas with other guys, they were just uh, natural athletes, and it came to them. And so as I started growing into my junior high years, I noticed how other guys were growing past me as a, in junior high. And again, that's aging me. I guess for now it's called a middle school. But uh, for me in junior high, uh, for those of you who want to know what that is, that's the high school before regular high school. It's junior high. So I had to explain that for you millennials. But I wasn't, uh, I didn't get much playing time on the team because my skill set wasn't at a level that could get me on the court as much. So what would happen is my other guys were, again, maturing farther, faster than I was. They were growing. Some of these guys were in, high, were in junior high going into their freshman year of high school, and they were 6'2", 6'3", you know, six foot tall, and here I was 5'10". And so I realized that in order for me to get on that court, in order for me to not be looked at as a scrub, I would have to put in some work to make my game develop and mature and grow. And so what I had to do was I would work on my game. I, I, I remember doing the little things, like I would be in bed or laying in my bed, and I would just look up at the, look up at the ceiling, and I'd have a, my basketball in my hand, and I would just lay on my bed and reach up and shoot, work on my form. But I worked on it to work on touch because I didn't want the ball to touch the uh, ceiling. I just wanted to get close to it and come back down in my hand soft. So that was working on my touch in, in a short game. I didn't realize it, but I knew that's in my head that's what I wanted to do. And so even in the winter, it, in Wisconsin here, it gets extremely cold in the winter, and especially in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. It got extremely cold. I mean, we'd have major blizzards. And I would go and shovel off the basketball court just so I could play. Now, mind you, I could not work on my dribbling or my handling skills, but what I could do was shoot a flat basketball and then go get the rebound. And I remember I would shoot until my hands was just felt like needles. Or, 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 I mean, they, they hurt. They would throb. And so I would go home, and I would take my gloves off, put my, glo my mittens on the heater to let them warm up and dry out. And I remember doing the worst thing you could ever do when your hands are cold. I would put them under warm water thinking that would warm them up and thaw them out. Little did I know the pain that would come from putting my, my cold hands under hot water, the needles Oh, my goodness, they hurt so bad. And I remember as, as a, a young boy crying about how hard, how hard this was and how, how much pain I was going through at the time with my hands. But as soon as that pain released and my gloves were dry, I'd get right back out there on that basketball court. Why? Because there was something in me that wanted to be better that was more important to me or, or was more of a force than that pain that said, don't do that again. Because usually pain is a lesson teacher that says, this hurts, don't do that. But for me, it was just like, okay, that's necessary roughness for me to get to that next level. And so I developed my game and by my, my senior year in high school, going into my freshman year in college, I had grown to six foot four which is the height I am now. And I had grown into a knowledge of my game and my body and what I could do and what I could accomplish. And I had watched guys play so much that I had analyzed their games and I saw their weaknesses and their flaws. So by the time I came back from my freshman year in college, I was giving those same guys who are so much better than me, I was giving them the business. Why? Because I worked out on a level 
that I could mature, so I can mature to the next level. And that's what I want to talk to us about today. I want to talk to us again about faith. That's what we've been talking about. But I want to talk about the different levels of faith and what it takes to get to the next level. And so there's three levels of faith. There is no faith, there is little faith, and then there's great faith. Now, the first thing we need to understand is everybody has faith. Everybody believes in something. Over in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 in the New King James, it says this, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. And I love how that, so God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith. All of us have a measure of faith. We all start off with the same amount of faith. And what God expects us to do is just like I did with my basketball game, worked on it, developed it, got it stronger, matured in it, learned how to skillfully handle it so I could get to that next level. And so here we are. I want to read Romans chapter 3 in the Passion Translation. And it reads like this. For God has given me grace to speak a warning about pride. I would ask each of you to be emptied of self-promotion and not create a false image of your importance. Instead, honestly assess your worth by using your God-given faith as the standard of measurement. And then you will see your true value with an appropriate esteem. He said, you'll see your true value. He said, listen, honestly assess your worth by your faith. Your worth by your God-given faith. This is where your value is. Your value is in your level of faith. How much can God use you? How usable are you by God? According to your faith, that's how much he can use you. Amen. Now, again, the first level we're going to talk about is no faith or non-believers. Now, these are people who have no faith in the word of God. And do not believe in Jesus, but they do believe in other things. Over in John chapter 20, verse 27 through 29 in the New King James says this. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it inside. And put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You're not a faith walker If you see it already, if it's already in manifestation, that's not believing, that's receiving. But if you can believe that something exists before you ever see it, that's faith. So often I see so many people say, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if I can't smell it, if I can't feel it, if I can't taste it, I don't believe it. So let me ask you this question. How many of you can see air? How many of you can see air? You can't see air, but you feel the results of air. You know if you don't have it, you don't live. You know on a a windy day, you can see leaves moving, but you cannot see air, but yet you believe it's there. You have faith in things, but you need to have faith in the word of God. Now, The definition of little faith, little or uh, the definition of no faith is, again, a person who does not believe in God. I don't believe your word. I don't believe your God. 
we are a part of the Big Bang Theory. We're not really a, no, there wasn't, there is no one creator. We, we are a result of scientific things happening that by happenstance, this just begin to be what it is and you are because of that. No, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I was made on purpose. And there's a God who made me on purpose. So I believe God. You have to, first of all, believe God. That's level one. Level two is little faith or weak faith. Weak faith or little faith um, has worry, fear, and doubt as signs that they have little faith. Worry, fear, and doubt are signs that you have little faith. If you have areas that you are worrying about or that you're doubting or that there's fear, that's an area that you have little faith in. Now, the definition of little is small or tiny in size, short in duration, not extensive, brief, not strong, not forceful, and not loud. Wow. Wow. So in areas where you have weak or little faith, your, little, your faith is brief, has a short duration, it's not strong, it's not forceful, and it's real quiet. How many areas have you kept your faith quiet in? How many areas has your faith been weak in? How many areas have your faith not had any force to get what you've been believing God for? That's little faith. Now, Turn with me, if you would, over to chapter 14. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. And I'm starting at verse 25. And again, I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation because it's really good. But here is a story where Jesus had just fed the 5,000 and he told his disciples, listen, get in the boat and go to the other side. And they got in the boat and got ready to go to the other side. And while they were in their boat, Jesus went and did some other things, and he went and prayed. And so verse 25, they're in the middle of the sea. And so here we start reading here, and it says this. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the waves. And when the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were ter terrified and screamed, Ghost! Now here's an amazing thing. Think about the speed that Jesus is moving at. That he told them to leave, and then he went and prayed and did some other things, and about 4 o'clock in the morning, he was walking past them. Think about this. The word had so much faith in the fact that what he said was going to be accomplished, that he saw them coming and he went past them. He didn't go get in the boat with them and say, listen, I'll just ride with y'all. No, he walked past them because he already gave them a directive. Go to the other side. And you got to understand, when the word speaks, it does not come back to it void. So the word spoke and it expected what, they, what he said to happen. And so here he is walking by. And here are these guys, first of all, they're thinking, what is that walking on the water? I get it. I get it. I'd be very concerned if I seen somebody walking on water too. And if you wouldn't be, I don't know. But I'd be very concerned. And so here they are, they're looking at Jesus walking on, the, walking on the water, and it says he walked on the waves. So it had to be wavy, but it didn't bother him. Then Jesus said this, when they hollered ghost, he realized that they were afraid. And this is what he said in verse 27. Then Jesus said, be brave. Don't be afraid. I'm here. Three things he said to him. Be brave. Don't be afraid. I am here. And there's three things that's significant in it. First thing he did was, again, I said this last week. The Bible says that Satan comes immediately to steal the, steal the word. But the word comes immediately to, steer, to steal doubt and fear. 
And he said, oh, I, I see you afraid. Be brave. I got to deal with that. Don't be afraid. And then know who's here. I am is here. Which means God is here. The great I am is here. And Peter shouted out, Lord, if it is really you to have me join you on the water, come and join me, Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out on the water and began to walk towards Jesus. Now there's two different uh, scenarios that I've heard people preach on concerning that. One is the faith of Peter to walk out there on the waves. And we've heard about that. But the other thing I look at is Jesus will even allow you, the word will even allow you, if you talk to him. He told, he gave him a directive, but he allowed him to change it to come to the word. I want to come to where you are, word. I want to come to where you are. And he allowed him to run an audible on his directive, which was go to the other side. Now, there was three faiths in action here. There was the faith of Jesus who um, allowed or gave enough power for him to walk on the water the same way Jesus did. There was the faith of Peter to say, I want to come. And then here's the other faith that was there, and people don't realize. The faith to stay the course was there with the other disciples who said, I'm not going out there. He said, go to the other side. That's what I'm doing. So the faith to stay the course was also right there. They did not get out that boat. They stayed and plugged in and said, come hell or high water, we're getting to the other side. I don't care how bad the storm is. We believe. The word said, go to the other side. He didn't say it was going to be easy. He didn't say it was going to be light. He didn't say it was going to be smooth. But he did say you were going to get to the other side. And that's the thing that you have to realize. People of little faith, they don't make it to the other side. Because circumstances and situations hit them and immediately doubt comes in. You have to stay your course. You have to get to that other side by believing Here's a storm, but I have the faith to get to the other side. Amen. And so, verse 30 says this. But when, let me go back to 29. Jesus told him, come join me, Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk towards Jesus. And when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Isn't it amazing that he still had enough sense to understand, all I got to do is cry out and he'll help me. He had enough sense to understand, all I got to do is cry out and he'll help me. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He understood that. And so here, let's keep reading. Verse 31, Jesus immediately, say immediately. He immediately stretched out his hand, lifted him, lifted him up and said, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? Oh, that's so good. He said, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? Listen, doubt beats little faith. Doubt beats little faith. He said, what little faith you have. When you got hit, you were, you were walking on the word of, of my uh, saying you could come. You were walking on that. You were, but when you saw, hey, I'm doing something beyond the norm. I'm doing something that nobody else is doing, that nobody else has ever done before. I'm being a pioneer in where I'm going right now, and it's scary, it's, it's unfamiliar. And when I look at where I am and my circumstances and my situation, 
I stop looking at the word. I look at me and where I am and I lose focus and I lose faith. Doubt comes in and wins over my little faith. Jesus. And the Bible says, and the very moment they both stepped into the boat and the raging wind ceased. Jesus understood y'all not ready to be without me. Y'all not ready to be without me. I got to get back here with you. I thought your faith was more mature that I didn't have to walk with you every step of the way, that you could believe what I told you, hear what I told you, believe what I told you, and do it until I return. But he realized, I got to get back in the boat with y'all. I see your level of faith. You have little faith. And so it's so important, people, that when you have little faith, you have to stay with the word. You have to stay with the word. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How you develop yourself from little faith and get your faith up is the same way that I did to make myself a better, better basketball. I practiced. I worked on it. I paid attention to it. I looked at the little details to get myself to notice the things I didn't know and notice where I was and also notice where I wanted to go. And that's what you have to do when it comes to your faith. When you look at your faith and you say, there's some areas that I'm kind of shaky in. There's some areas that I'm kind of doubting in. There's some areas that I, I feel like I'm, 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 I need to come up in. I, you read the word and faith building yourself up on your most holy faith. Amen? Over Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, verse 8, says this in the New King James. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Here it is, he's talking to the disciples about feeding others, and he said, it's when you reason among yourself. When you start to, when you start to reason with yourself versus taking your thoughts and comparing them to the word, you have little faith. Because what your, what your reasoning will do, reasoning will always go towards the easiest way. Listen, the easiest way to do this is this. So I reason, my reasoning is, why not do it the easy way? Faith is never easy, but it's always right. Let me say that again. Faith is never easy. It's never the easy way, but it's always the right way. It's always God's way. You've got to walk by faith. Another example is Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. It says, now... If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, it's still here, and tomorrow is thrown into an oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye, or O you of little faith? Again, it's people of little faith are people who doubt or are concerned about their circumstances and their situations more than whether or not God can take care of that. Doubters, according to the word of God, have little or no faith. Doubters, according to the word of God, have little or no faith. People with weak faith are easily swayed away from the truth. Trials and temptations overcome them. And they fall easily and continuously, always repeating, repenting, and asking for forgiveness. Any area where you continue to fall in is an area that you have little weak, 
you have weak faith over or little faith over. But any area that you do not fall in, you don't miss the mark in it, is an area where your faith is strong in. Now, you may not, now some of you may say, listen, I do have faith, but things come up against me to challenge me, and I become unsure about some things. Now, the Bible talks about that over in James. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, it says this again in the New King James. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, or her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking no thing. And if any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of God who gives it to you liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask how in faith. Let him ask him what? In faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. We just talked about that. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, he's a double-minded man, and he's unstable in all his ways. No, he's unstable in some. All his ways. No, he's unstable in most. All his ways. When you have a mind that is, I'm I'm good sometimes and I'm bad other times, that's double-minded, that's a wavering mind, and you're unstable in all your ways. And God said, a man who doubts, he will receive no thing from God, nothing. You got to stay at a place of consistently believing God, consistently trusting God, hearing his word, receiving his word, believing his word, and holding on to his word. You have to do that. And then let me say this, and only say what his word says. Don't say anything opposite of the word. If you want the results of his word, only say what his word says. Don't say anything other than what has God said about that. What has God already declared? What has he already decreed? What has he already done concerning that? Believe that and I'm only saying what God has already said. Confession means to repeat and agree with what's already been said. And that's what God has said. Make a confession. The Bible says, hold fast to your confession of faith. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. Now, I want to read uh, that same passage in the Passion Translation. And it reads like this. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you are in that condition? My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. When your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And when, I'm sorry, and then, as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. Again, and then when your endurance grows, when your endurance grows, Even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. And if anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. 
He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scold you over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with gracious or with generous grace. Just make sure you ask, empowered by confident faith, without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like a rough sea, driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. He said, listen to me, y'all. Being in a wavering condition, he said, do you think that condition makes you feel like you should receive anything from God? Well, God, I believe you sometimes, and I don't other times. That's a little faith. He said, don't believe you'll receive anything. Just build your faith up so you can believe you receive every time. Now, let's look at another scenario. Let's look at what God said about Abraham receiving the promises, being the father of many nations. Now, over in Romans chapter 4, verses 16 through 22, it says this in the New King James. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to the grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. Now, mind you, when God changed Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, the, word Abra- the name Abraham means father of many nations. So every time somebody called him father of many, every time somebody called his name, they said father of many nations, Father of many nations. Now, my, how would you feel if somebody steadily called you father of many nations and every time you look at your home, you see, I have a child, but I don't have one with my wife. I don't have one that God said the promised seed will come through her. This is our promise. This is where the many nations will come. It's through Sarah. And when people call me father of many nations and I don't see one child come out of her, that can be very discouraging. It's almost like, stop calling me that. I don't see any children. Stop calling me that. I'm not seeing any nations coming out of her. Stop calling me that. It could almost be a ridicule and a mock if your faith isn't in the correct place. If you're not seeing as God reminding you of who you are. And what he told you you are. And what he told you to do. If if you don't look at it as a reminder, then you look at it as a mock of somebody playing games with you and telling you what you're not. Versus somebody else, if you're believing by faith, somebody telling you who you are and what what you're supposed to accomplish. And so he's hearing this. Father of many nations, father of many nations. Verse 17 says, "As as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. And in the presence of him whom he believed, God has given God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He said, being not weak in faith, I did not consider. I did not look at my circumstances. I did not look at my situation. I did not look at when God, you said this, we were young and still Liking each other. Now we're old and we're tolerating one another. I don't, she, I don't know how attractive she is now to me, God. But he did not consider his body because his body had nothing to do with the promise. The word that was in his heart had everything to do with the promise. 
His circumstances did not change the word. The word changes the circumstances. God knew that he wasn't going to allow Sarah to have that child for an extended length of time. He knew that Sarah's faith had to be built up. He knew that Abraham's faith had to be built up. And he also knew that Abraham had to be reminded in the meantime, that time between the promise being spoken and the promise being manifested, remind me of what you said before I forget it. Let it go and not mess with it anymore. Remind me. Call me father of many nations. Have people tell me what you called me. Let other people be a witness to what you said to me. So that when I walk throughout this world and I'm looking around seeing you're calling me father of many nations, but I'm not seeing it. Thank you for that boost of faith. Thank you for somebody speaking your word to me again, saying father of many nations. The Bible says he did not consider his body. Nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20 said, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Every time he looked at another child going by, I just can see Abraham saying, Father, I thank you for my son. When he see kids playing around him, he's going, Father, I thank you for my son. When he's seeing other kids growing up and having kids, Father, I thank you for my son. I'm sure he had to keep himself encouraged. Father, you said I would be the father of many nations. That's what you call me. That's what the people call me. And I know, I know I'm not just going to be this by faith, but I'm going to see it in reality, in manifestation. And that's the place where you got to stay. You got to keep yourself. He said he did not. He did not let go. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21 says, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform and therefore, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. He was fully convinced. A person that is not weak in faith is a person that is fully convinced. Now, the third level of faith. The third level of faith is great faith. Great faith means to be faithful to be steadfast, to be unmovable, and have no doubt. No doubting. No doubting. No doubting. No doubting. None. To have great faith. That means you are completely sold out to faith. If you've ever tried to go to a concert and... You wanted to get a ticket, but all the tickets were sold out. What does that mean? There is no more room for anybody else to participate. So when you're completely sold out to faith, there is no more room for doubt to participate. Doubt can't get in the room because faith is full. Go with me, if you would, over to Matthew chapter 8, starting at verse 5. Talking about great faith, say great faith. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is dying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, to, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. I understand who you are. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. 
and to my servants do this, and he does it. And Jesus heard it and marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Wow. Here is a man of great faith. He understands the power of words and the power of words spoken by someone in authority. He said this. Listen, I understand how this works. I got people over me and I got people under me. The people over me tell me what to do and I do it without question. And the people under me do what I tell them to do without question. Not wavering. They do it whether they understand it or not. And he said, listen, Jesus, I understand what a command is because I am a commander. When you give me a command, I obey the commands because I've been taught to do that. And what we need to be do, doing and learning is just like the centurion to understand when you're given a command, you follow out that command regardless to whether you like it, understand it, or know what it is, you do it. And when we walk in a place of faith like that, Father, you told me to do this. I may not like it. I may not understand it. I may not know why I'm doing it. But I'm going to do it because I trust you and because you said it. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to hear. And he understood that. And Jesus said, my God, I can just hear him now. My God, ain't nobody else around me believing this word like you believe in it. Ain't nobody else around me understanding this like you understanding this. That's some great faith. When I don't have to come to where you are, I can just send my word and let it heal them. And dropping down to verse 13, it says this. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done to you. As his servant was healed that same hour. Again, this man got what he believed for because he believed the word and the word was there to heal. He believed all the word has to do is speak. All the word has to do is declare and decree. Because God watches over his word to perform it. All the word has to do is say it. And if I believe what he said, I'll get what he said. If I believe what he said, I'll get what he said. So I believed him. And he said, be healed. And my servant was healed. Now let's look at another example over in Matthew chapter 15. Verse 21 says this. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre, of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. For she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bed and throw it to little dogs. Woo! And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answers, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Listen to what, what kind of faith this woman had. This woman, first of all, went to some place she wasn't supposed to be. He said, listen, I, I ain't called to y'all. I'm called to this certain amount of people right now at this time. She said, that, I get it. I get it. 
but I, but I know you got what I need. So I'm going to push past where people feel like I shouldn't be to get what I need. And so here we go again. So she cried out even more. She said, listen, first I cried out to him. Now I'm worshiping you. You're amazing, and I know you can do this. And at first, when she first cried out, the word was silent. How many times have you been looking and crying out to God, and God was silent? He was just silent. You didn't hear anything. I didn't get an answer on that. That's where your faith has to be at a place where you'll stick with it until you hear from God. And so this woman said, okay, now I'm coming to worship you. And then when I worship, when she worshiped her, she got called a dog. She got called a dog. She said, listen, I can't give meat to the dogs. She said, wait, 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 let me help you understand something. I don't care what you call me, but even dogs get crumbs. She didn't even care about the disrespect. Some of you can't get past disrespect to get the blessing or the uh, manifestation of what you want because you've been disrespected. And disrespect leads to offense. Oh, who? Don't nobody need you like that, Jesus, calling, some pe- calling people dogs. What you th- who you think you are? I'm the one that can heal you. I am a healer. I am the healer. Now, there's a way you can come to me. You can get up in your pride and go, you don't talk to me like that, or you can stay humble. Stay at a place where you can still receive. And when Jesus thought she could, saw that she still could receive and still stayed in a place of humility and never disrespected his position, he said to her, Oh, woman, great is your faith. He recognized it. She had enough faith that would not deter her regardless to what was said about her, regardless to how she felt, because I'm sure she felt disrespected. But what was more important, her, her standing up for her disrespect or her daughter being healed? People of great faith stay focused on the task, not the problems along the road to the finish line. If you ever run track, you don't, If you've ever seen people run track, they don't look at hurdles as a problem. They look at hurdles as a part of the race. They get over them and they keep it moving. And when you are at a place of great faith, hurdles, you just get over them and you keep it moving. You don't get stuck at a hurdle. You get over it and you keep it moving. She got over it and kept it moving. And Jesus said, listen, oh, woman of great faith. Go your way. What you desire, your daughter is being healed this very hour. This very hour, y'all. Don't get caught up on what people are saying while you're going through, while you're walking in faith, while you're believing in faith. Don't get caught up on people saying you dumb for doing that. Why are you doing it? don't take all that. Don't get caught up with that. Those are hurdles that you just got to get over and keep running your race. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. That very same hour, we have to keep ourselves at a place, y'all. If you want great faith, great faith takes a great amount of time spent in and with the Word. I'm sure this woman had a level of faith anyway that she was willing to go up to him. She understood, hey, that's a healer. Rumors have been going around that he's healing, and I know he can do this thing. I've heard about what he did with the centurion, sir. I've heard about some other healings he's done. And so I believe he can do the same for me. Now, I don't know what their circumstances were. Maybe, maybe she was so ignorant of the process that she thought this was what happens before you get what you need. Sometimes you need to be ignorant of the process because so many people can tell you, can tell you 
see, I went through this, and then I went through that, and then I had to do this, and then I had to do that. When that may not be the way God wants you to get what you need or what you're believing him for. That was their process. That may not be your process. They may have gotten it easy, but God may be trying to strengthen and build your faith for not just this that you're, you're, you're going after, but what he knows you're going to need to go after beyond this. That I may need to strengthen your faith in this moment so that when you go after that thing in the next moment, it'll be easy. So don't trip if the way you're going through it and the way you're getting to the promise isn't the same way everybody else is uh, going through around you. Just believe God. Stay your course, like I said last week. Great faith. Know that there's hurdles coming, but know that I'm spending the time that I need to with the word. Him changing my heart. Him filling my heart. Faith coming and coming and coming so that when it's time for me to use my faith, I have it. Understand this. If you stay Stay full of faith, you'll never have to get in faith. If you stay at a place of being fed and full of faith, you'll never have to get yourself at a place of building yourself up so you, you'll have it already. You'll already be built up. You'll be ready for it before it ever comes. Stay at that place of faith. Now, Abraham had to be at a place when he was dealing with the deadness of Sarah's womb, that he, that he had to be fully, being fully convinced. And that's the place where I believe God wants us to get, y'all, and stay. We got to be fully convinced that God's word works regardless to the amount of time it takes, regardless to the how, how many people come, how many people go, how many jobs I lose or get regardless to how many homes I lose or gain, regardless to my finances or, my, or my, my body, God's word works. And I believe God's word over any circumstance, situation, problem, any of that, I believe God's word. And when you stay at a place where you are fully convinced, I'm not partially convinced. I'm not sort of convinced. I'm not mostly convinced. I am fully convinced. It's like this. I am fully convinced I'm a man. And it ain't because of just the way I look. It's what I believe. And it's what God has told me I am. And so because he told me I am, I believe that and can't anybody change my mind. I don't care what gets cut off, put on, removed. I am still a man. Why? Because God says I'm a man. And I'm convinced I am a man. I'm fully persuaded that I am a man. Full-grown, full-blooded man. And when you understand that, when you get to the place that nothing and nobody can change the way you think about what God has said to you, and what God has said about you, when you get to that fully persuaded, fully convinced place, that's when you know you're in a place of great faith. And so you need to build yourself up in every area. You know, you can't be like um, some of these basketball players that are out there in this world right now, and they're professionals, and they're, and they're one-dimensional. Like, some players are just shooters. That's, that, that's their specialty. They shoot. Don't ask them to play defense because they're not going to do that. But they spot up in a corner. You give them the ball or they get to their sweet spot. They shoot. Count it. That's what they are. They're one-dimensional. Some players just play defense. That's it. I'm going to shut somebody down. Somebody's not going to get the average on the court today. I'm not going to score. I'm not, I'm not, I may not even rebound. But I am going to defend, and somebody's not one-dimensional. But if you want to be great, you got to be more than one-dimensional. you got to have more than one trick. you got to be more than a one-trick pony. you got to have more buckshot in your arsenal than one thing. You cannot just believe in one thing and not have your faith be built 
and other areas. Make, that, make your faith life high across the board. Not, well, I got great faith in tithing, but I got little faith in healing, and I got great faith in, in, in saving, but I got little faith in walking in love. Make your faith even across the board. Bring it all up to the level of great faith. And if you bring all your faith up to a level of great, your life will be lived on a great faith level. Your entire life. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. All of it on the same level. And so I'm just looking forward to what God is going to do. So this is what I need you to do. This week, evaluate yourself. Look at your life. Look and see if there's areas that you've been doubting, that, that you're wavering in some areas. The areas where your faith hasn't gotten you steadfast and unmovable, where you're not secure and firm, build yourself up in that area so you can be secure and firm. Get yourself up to a strong, immovable, able to move mountains of faith. But that come from spending time in the Word. But you do that self-evaluation. Check and see where you are. Because only you know where you are. Only you know where you are. Because you can, you can make people think that you have great faith just because you'll say certain things in front of people like, oh, that's a person of faith. But in reality, you are trembling in your boots. In reality, you don't believe what you said. You just believed it because at the time you needed to make people think you were much more mature than what you really are. But check yourself out. Check yourself out. See where you are. And I'm telling you, once you recognize and do that self-evaluation and you begin to figure out, this is where I need to work on my faith game at. This is where I need to work on my faith game. This is where I need to come up. When I was working on my, my game, I was working on sliding drills, on how to be a better defender. I was working on rebounding, on how to go get rebounds. I was working on timing, on how to block shots, and working on timing, on how to catch rebounds off the rim and, and dunk them back in. I was working on, 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 on the proper technique of shooting my jump, working on all that. Working on making myself not reach so I could get fouls. I was working on that. I evaluated and saw these are areas I'm weak in that I need to get stronger in if I'm going to be as good as I want to be. And I did that and achieved it. Build your faith up. And no good thing will be withheld from you. Abraham's faith was accounted to him for righteousness, which means because he believed God, he was in right standings with God. You want to stay in right standings with God? And you want to be the father of many, whatever it is, or the mother of many, whatever you believe in God for? Keep your faith in God and his word. Amen. Listen, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for helping us uh, get this word out. Thank you for sharing it and hosting all the watch parties that, that the people have been hosting. I'm telling you, if we get this faith out there and get it going viral, it will change this whole situation we're in and your whole situation a whole lot sooner. But what I want to do is pray for you right now. If you're here and you're under the sound of my voice and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to give you the opportunity. Again, the Bible says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so you don't have to be in a church building to be saved. You can get saved right there in your bed, right there on your couch, right there at your breakfast table, wherever you are this morning. You can give your life to Christ and change. Go from eternal darkness to eternal life and light. Repeat these words after me. Bow your head and close your eyes. Father, you said in your word that, Lord Jesus, if I confess you with my mouth and believe in my heart that you died on the cross for my sins that I will be saved. So I confess you today and I ask you to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. 
open up the eyes of my understanding and let me see who I really am in you. No more cloudy thinking and cloudy seeing, Father. May I see clearly what you see in me. May I see fully what you see in me. May I believe wholly what you believe about me. And so, Father, I ask today that you would send me to a ministry that would help me, help me develop in my walk with you and my knowledge of you. I need to know so much more of you, Father. I want to know so much more about you. Help me. I receive salvation today, but I'm not staying here. I want to know more. So I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Listen, if you said that prayer and you want to stay connected with uh, World Outreach, we'd love, we would love to help you get along the path that God has prepared for you. So the number you can call to our office is on the screen right now, or you can go to our website, worldoutreachbtc.org, and, you know, leave some information, and we'll get back to you. We want to help you get to that place of great faith. Now, all the great faith people, make some noise. All right, listen, here's where you can help get this gospel out. We need to get this word out to more people. It's not just your sharing, but it's your sharing of your resources to help us get this out. We're trying to get it on every platform we can get it on. We know that if we can get people believing in God and increasing his kingdom, we know that things will change. And so help us. Now is a great opportunity to sow. The information is, is up under me right now on the screen. And you can text World Outreach Give to 77977. Or you can go to our app, World Outreach and Bible Training Center app. You can go there and use the app. Or you can go to our website at worldoutreachbtc.org. Got another way. You can mail it in if you're old school. You can mail it in to World Outreach and Bible Training Center or WOC at 3410 West Silver Spring Drive, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53209. All seeds, no matter what the size is, will be used to get the gospel out. We thank you so much for sowing in to our ministry and helping us get this gospel out. Remember, Wednesday, we have service Wednesday right here at 6.30. Um, we also have uh, prayer every morning from 6 to 6.30. You can also be a part of that. Always ways for you to connect. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you soon.